Y'all going to help me preach a little bit today? You got a few amens and praise God's on the inside. All right, glory to God. We're teaching a sermon series on the Holy Spirit. This is week two, and today's message is entitled, The Anointing. Everybody say, The Anointing. Yes. If we need anything, we need more of the anointing of the Holy Ghost. If we're going to do God's will in the earth today, we need more anointing of the Holy Ghost. If we're going to further the cause of Christ in the earth today, we need more of the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Turn to your neighbor and say, You need more anointing. And <laughs> turn to yourself and say, I need more anointing. Somebody say, thank God, God has got more anointing. The Holy Spirit is not running out of the anointing. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Someone say, thank God. Say, thank God for the anointing of the Holy Ghost is available. Oh, I thank you for that, Lord Jesus. Turn with me to John 16, verse 7. Jesus said, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is your advantage that I go away. Now, in the last days of Christ, he's talking about the Holy Spirit. I think what people talk about in their last days is what they feel most urgently about. Don't you? The thing that they think is most important are the things that they're talking about just before they go home to glory. And in John 14, 15, 16, Jesus is talking about the comforter, the helper, the advocate, the guide, the Holy Spirit. Jesus said in John 16 and 17, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper, the Holy Spirit, the comforter, the paraclete, the one who comes alongside us to stand with us and to strengthen us, he will not come to you if I do not go away. But if I depart, I will send him, the helper, to you. I say, thank God we got the Holy Ghost. Can you imagine when Jesus told his disciples, it's to your advantage that I go away. They must have thought, are you kidding me? No way. You have been our teacher, our guide, our helper, our provider. You've been our alpha to the omega. All that we have need of Lord Jesus. You have been that to us. And you're telling us you're going away. No, please do not go away. And then Jesus says, no, it's to your advantage that I go away. Because I walked with you, but I'm sending someone who will live inside you. And he's just like me. Hallelujah. Someone say hallelujah. hallelujah. I will send him to you. Now last week we defined the person and the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. We defined just who the him, the helper was that Jesus was sending to us. And that is so very important because we must understand that the person of the Holy Spirit is God. He's the third person of the Godhead. We believe in one God. We are monotheistic. Uh, theo meaning God. Mono meaning one. But we believe that one God is expressed in a Godhead, in a Holy Trinity. And we see that implied in the Old Testament, in the grammar, the, the way God used personal pronouns in reference to himself. He said, let us make man in our own image, and so on and so forth. And we taught all of that last week. But one of the most interesting points we found in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our our God is one Lord. Verse 5, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and all thy might. Well, the Lord our God is one Lord, but in the original language there, and we have on slide number 2, what that really means. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord, that word Lord is Yahweh, the personal name of God, our God, Elohim, that really is a plural word used of God. It could be, it could be defined gods. So Yahweh, our gods, is ekod. That means one, but it's not a singular one. It is a unified one, Yahweh. Again, the personal name of God. So you could read it this way. Hear, O Israel. Our Yahweh, our gods, is one united Yahweh. 
So we see a reference to the Trinity even as uh, God is referring to himself. Well, that is the Old Testament where it's implied, but in the New Testament it's very explicit. In fact, we have verses that we went over last week that we saw that the Father is called God explicitly. The Son is called God explicitly. The Holy Spirit is called God explicitly. And so each of them is named God, and then each of them in certain passages, we see all three of them together functioning at the same time, distinctly separate, specifically at the uh, baptism of Christ. Jesus, God, the Son of God is being baptized in water. Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God is coming down upon him. And then Father God speaks from heaven. This is my uh, Son in whom I am well pleased. And so we see passage after passage where all three of them are together, operating together, but distinctly separate, yet they make up the one God. Everybody say, one God. Three in one. Godhead. Holy Trinity. And everybody said, praise the Lord. Now, the reason why that doctrinal point is so important is because the New Testament church must embrace the revelation and the full understanding that the Holy Spirit is God deserving of all of our attention and our honor and our devotion. Because until we understand the person, the divinity of the Holy Spirit, we will not honor the presence of the Holy Spirit. And until we honor the presence of the Holy Spirit, we will not know the power of the Holy Spirit. Put up slide number three for me, if you would. When we recognize His person, His divinity, and honor His presence, then we will experience His power, which is the anointing. I want everybody to read that out loud with me, if you would, all together now. When we recognize His person, God, and honor His presence, then we will experience His power, which is the anointing. This is a tremendous point right here because there are a lot of church-going folks that do not understand this revelation. There's a lot of churches that do not understand His revelation because we sideline the Holy Spirit. Therefore, we're not allowing His presence into the New Testament church the way He should be honored as the honored guest in the church of Jesus Christ. And therefore, we do not experience His power or His manifestation or his anointing on the life of the believer. All ministry begins when the anointing flows. Ministry does not begin until the anointing is applied to the believer. We see the type and shadow of this in the Old Testament with prophet, priest, and king. They did not enter into their office or were consecrated into their office until they were anointed with oil as a sign and symbol of the anointing or approval of God, the power of God upon that individual who was going to be the prophet, priest, or king, whatever office he was filling. So once he was anointed, he would then step into or was consecrated for that office or role that he was uh, ministering unto the Lord about. We see this in the ministry of Christ in Matthew 3. We looked at it last week that when Jesus was baptized in water and the anointing of the Holy Spirit fell upon him, the Bible is very, very clear that it was at that point that he entered into ministry. He did not minister in the first 30 years of his life as the Messiah. Now, he has always been the Son of God and he's always been anointed, but it was upon that anointing on his ministry that he became anointed for his uh, earthly ministry and that's where you begin to see the miracle signs and wonders. The anointing is by definition the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. Read that together with me. The anointing is the power and the presence 
of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. That's what the anointing is. The anointing is the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Let me give you three verses as reference. Acts chapter 10, verse 38. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. Everything Jesus did, he did as an anointed man. Oh yes, he was fully God, son of God, fully divine, but he was also fully man. Everything he did, he did as a man anointed by the Holy Spirit. He never put away his divinity, but he did put away his divine privilege and then operated as a man anointed. That's why he called himself the Son of Man. He was the Son of God and the Son of Man. And so it says in Acts 10, 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit. So there you have the presence. And with the power, there you have the power of the anointing who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil. So the anointing is the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. We see that in the life of Jesus right there. But then look in Luke chapter 24, verse 49. Jesus said, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. There's the presence of the promise or the baptism with the Holy Spirit. And tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. So right in that verse, you have both the presence upon you and the power with you. And then again in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And you shall receive power... When the Holy Spirit is come upon you, upon you, presence, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit is present upon you. And then ministry begins. And you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. And so when ministry begins when the anointing is applied. And the anointing is the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. So my message to the church in the earth today is we must understand that the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit in his person. We must welcome him then, his presence. We must roll out the red carpet. We must put out the welcome mat. We must give him the honored place. We must make room for the move of the Holy Spirit in the church today. And the church said, Amen. Because when you Give him his due as the third person of the Godhead. And when you make welcome his presence, that's when the power of the anointing of the Holy Spirit begins to operate in the church. And the same thing is true with the believer. When the believer says, of course, I've been talking about it corporately now, but let's talk about it individually. When the believer says, I honor you, Holy Spirit. I recognize that Jesus has sent you to live on the inside of me me, to mold me, shape me like clay on a potter's wheel, to be more like Jesus. I want to think the thoughts of Jesus, speak the words of Jesus, do the works of Jesus. Come on now. Come on. And we honor. That's when the anointing comes on our life. Oh, I thank you for the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Now, every believer is anointed. Every believer if you're a born-again believer, you are anointed by the Holy Spirit. And we know that from 1 John 2 and 27. But the anointing which you have received from Him abides in you. If you're a born-again believer, the Holy Ghost lives on the inside of you. And the church said, thank God. <laughs> Amen. Thank God. And so you have the presence of the Holy Spirit. But we don't, just because we have the presence of the Holy Spirit doesn't mean that we're always operating in the power of the Holy Spirit because we don't always give the presence of the Holy Spirit His room to operate. But the anointing which you have received of Him abides in you and you do not need that anyone teach you but as the same is in you but the same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true and is not a lie and just as it has taught you you will abide in him so you have an anointing everybody say i am, I am. Anointed. anointed but you don't want that anointing just to be something that bubbles to the surface on occasion 
You don't want that anointing to be the oil that rises up on occasion to the surface where you experience a little bit of, woo, thank you, Jesus, uh, on occasion. No, you want to walk in the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit all the time. Hey, you remember Jed from the Beverly Hillbillies? He was out hunting one day, and he shot after some game and hit the ground, and up from the ground came a bubbling crew. Oil, that is. Texas tea. That's right. And, and it just kind of bubbled up by chance. I said by chance. It just bubbled up. Now it made him a rich man, and he was thankful. But it was just by chance that he hit it. You don't want to hit the Holy Ghost by chance. You don't want the Holy Ghost just to bubble up on the inside of you. You want a full endowment from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet, from the inside to the outside. You want to be baptized. You want a Holy Ghost saturation with the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Look with me in Psalms 133, verse 2. The Holy Ghost is like the precious oil upon the head running down on the beard. The beard of Aaron running down to the edge of his garments. Yeah, when they anointed the high priest Aaron, they did not do a little dab of do ya. It was, not, it was not just a little dab on, on the, you're good to go, Aaron, a little dab on, on the, no, they got out the bucket, <laughs> hallelujah. They got out the bucket of the good stuff. This was the good oil, the anointing oil. That it, it took a lot of time to make this oil. This was the expensive stuff. And they just poured it over Aaron. And it went from the top of his head. You imagine how much oil that took to run from the top of his head, down through his beard, down his garments, to the hem of his garments, till he was saturated with the anointing oil. Oh, yeah. Come on. Amen. Well, that's a description, that's a type and shadow of the believer's experience in the Holy Ghost. We are supposed to be saturated with the anointing of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is supposed to saturate our thinking. The Holy Ghost anointing is supposed to be on our speaking and on our thinking and on our living and on our, the passions of our heart. We need more anointing. We need more Holy Ghost. We need to quit, listen, we need to quit reacting to everything in the flesh and start reacting to some stuff in the Holy Ghost. We need to start Quit. We need to get over our fear and over our doubt and over our unbelief. We need to get over our sin and get over Satan and get over our selfishness. We need to get over our lack and our limit and our un. We need to get into the Holy Ghost and fire. I said we need to get into the Holy Ghost. We need the wind blowing in the upper room. We need the fire on the altar. We need the river of living waters flowing in the house of God once again because we need more Holy Ghost. And once we think we got all the Holy Ghost that we can handle, God's got more Holy Ghost. Jesus said, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. And he that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. How many of y'all want a river? How many of y'all want a river? He said, rivers! 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 Of Holy Ghost anointing. Hallelujah. Like the precious oil upon the head. But then there's enough to run down to the beard. Amen. Down past the beard onto the garment. Down the garment to the hem of the garment. Thank you, Jesus. God called every believer to be anointed, super anointed, Amen. baptized in the Holy Ghost. When Jesus, just before he went to the cross, just talked about the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost. He says, I want you to know who I'm sending to you. I'm sending the Holy Ghost to you. He's going to be just like me. He's going to be another comforter. He's going to be another helper. He's going to be another teacher. He's going to come alongside you. He's going to be your paraclete. He's going to be your coach. He's going to be your alpha to the omega. He's going to be everything that you have need of. He's going to be exactly like me. He's going to be another one of me. Except he's going to live on the inside of you. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you. That's what Jesus talked about just before he went to the cross. And then the day he was raised from the grave, the first thing that he was talking about was the baptism with the Holy Ghost. That's the first thing that he was talking about. 
Acts chapter 1, verse 4. And being assembled together with them, commanded that they should not depart from Jerusalem. Now this is his message to the entire church in the earth at that moment. It wasn't big, but it was all there was. And it was his message to the church. And the message to the church has not changed. Being assembled together with them, commanded that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, that's the baptism with the Holy Spirit, which you have heard, uh, which saith he, you've heard of me, verse 5. For John truly baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And we know that, that that would come on the day of Pentecost, 50 days later. So on that day, resurrection day, John chapter 20, verse 20, he breathed on them said receive ye the Holy Ghost now they're born again but they're waiting for the baptism you can be born of the Spirit but not baptized in the Holy Ghost oh yes and Jesus said to the church I want everybody baptized in the Holy Spirit it's the message to the church. So Jesus, now let me just frame this. There's three baptisms in the church. Slide number five, please. There's three baptisms in Scripture that we recognize. The first baptism is the baptism as a born-again believer. The Spirit baptizes us into the body of Christ. That's when you are born again, born of the Spirit. So the Holy Spirit does that, and He baptizes us into the body of Christ. That's in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Number two, then the church baptizes the believer as in water as a public profession of their faith. So number one, the church uh, spirit baptizes you into the body of Christ. Then the church, the body of Christ, baptizes you in water as a public profession of your faith. And then number three, Christ then baptizes the believer in the Holy Spirit and with fire. Now in Matthew chapter 3 verse 11, John the Baptist said, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So Jesus is the baptizer with the Holy Spirit and with fire. This is what Jesus did after he went to heaven. He said, I'm sending an advantage back to you. John uh, 14, I'm sending an advantage back to you. And that advantage is the baptism with the Holy Spirit. John 16, I correct myself. I'm sending an advantage back to you. And that is the baptism with the Holy Spirit. So the ministry of Christ right now, besides our advocate and besides our being our high priest, he is the baptizer with the Holy Spirit. Nothing has changed. Jesus is still baptizing people with the Holy Spirit. And the church said, Amen. Amen. I said, The church said, Amen. Amen. Now, the early church was adamant about this revelation. Because the early church had experienced exactly what Jesus was talking about. They were closed up in an upper room. Doors were locked. Windows were closed. They were in fear for their lives. Uh, what happened to Jesus might happen to them. Crucifixion. And so they thought, we, there's a death sentence on us. And we'd better stay behind these locked doors. And then the wind started blowing in that upper room. And the wind came and the Holy Ghost fell and the fire upon them and they were anointed and the doors sprang open and they spill out into the streets and 3,000 souls were saved at the preaching of Peter on the day of Pentecost. So the early church understood the anointing and the power of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And they were adamant, they were determined that every church after that was going to be a spirit-filled Pentecostal church. Amen. Come on, say amen. amen. Let me make the point in Acts chapter 8, beginning in verse 12. The evangelist Philip had gone to Samaria and had a tremendous revival. And souls were being saved and people were believing the word of God and they were getting baptized in water as their public profession of faith. Acts chapter 8, verse 12. 
And when the people believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. So they're believers and they're water baptized and yay, the church is born and tremendous revival has broken out in Samaria. Clearly, they are believers. Clearly, they've been water baptized as believers. Now, verse 14. When the apostles... And Jerusalem heard about these things. Who were in Jer Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God. They sent Peter and John. Now Peter was the preacher of Pentecost. Peter's the one who stood up on the day of Pentecost and said, This is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. In the last days I will pour out of my spirit upon all fresh flesh. So they said, we need to send Peter, the preacher of Pentecost, to this brand new church to make sure that they're baptized in the Holy Ghost just like we're baptized in the Holy Ghost. Let me keep on reading. Y'all following along with me? All right, verse 14. The apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God. They sent Peter and John to them who, verse 15, when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. They're already born again believers. The Holy Spirit already lives on the inside of them, but they are not baptized with the Holy Ghost. They don't have the super anointing yet. Oh, hallelujah. Prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Verse 16, for as yet he had fallen on none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Verse 17, when they laid hands on them, they received the Holy Ghost. Verse 18, and when Simon saw that through the laying on of the hands of the apostles that the Holy Spirit was given, he offered money. Verse 19, saying, give me this power also that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. It says in verse 18, Simon saw. What did he see? He saw them speaking with other tongues. He saw a physical manifestation of them receiving the Holy Spirit. That's why, that's one of the passages why we believe that tongues is the initial physical evidence of speaking in, uh, or being baptized with the Holy Spirit, Acts 2, 10 and 19. Well, this is an additional one. So Simon said, wow, you lay hands on people and they speak in foreign languages? Uh, I want that power because he's a sorcerer. He operates in the spirit realm. He says, I want that kind of spiritual power. And they said, you got to be kidding me. You're offending. God. God has given them the Holy Spirit freely. Why are you trying to buy what God gives away freely? Jesus already paid the price. I said Jesus already paid the price. The blood has been shed. The Spirit has been given. Anybody with faith can ask for the Holy Ghost and God will freely give us the Holy Ghost. He said you're crazy. You're crazy. And then in verse 19, uh, chapter 19 of Acts 19, Acts 19, beginning in verse 1. My point is the early church was adamant that churches should be filled, that believers should be filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit so that they would have the anointing, the presence, and the power of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 19, verse 1. And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. Now, Ephesus was a pagan city. It was a heathen city. It was a mess. Talk about an antichrist city. Finding some disciples there. Now, there had been some that had been converted, and they were disciples of Christ. Anytime Luke used the word disciples, and Luke wrote the book of Acts, it meant a Christian believer. That was his terminology for Christian believer. So they found some disciples. Paul did in verse 2. And he said to these disciples, Have you received the Holy Spirit when you believed? Or in the original language it means, Having believed, did you receive the Holy Spirit? He recognized them as believers. They were disciples of Jesus. They were believers. But his question to them was, are y'all baptized in the Holy Ghost? Have you received the anointing that Jesus died to give to us? And, and what was their answer? We've not even heard whether there be a Holy Spirit. This is the answer 
that many, 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 many church-going folks would give. This is an answer that much of the body of Christ in the earth today would give. When you would say, hey, are you full of the Holy Ghost? Are you baptized with the Holy Ghost and with fire? And the answer would be, I didn't even know there was a Holy Ghost and fire. What are you talking about? A Holy Ghost and fire. And I know that to be true because that's my own testimony. I'm a church kid. I was raised in church. I mean, to my parents' credit, they had me and my brothers in church all the time. Every time the church doors were open, we were in it. I was in every Sunday school class you could be in, every youth group you could be in. I was on every youth camp you could go to. I was in youth choir. I was even in the bell choir. I did it all. I was an acolyte. I was the kid that showed up early before everybody else and lit the candles on the altar. I did not miss a church service, whether it was Sunday morning or Sunday night or Wednesday night or youth group meeting or choir practice. I was there all the time, much to my parents' credit. All my friends, my social circle was in that church. But that church, as much as it taught me to love God, as much as it taught me to honor the Word of God, as much much as it taught me to have a moral foundation and a moral compass in my life it, and all that it taught me and I love it to this day it did not teach me about the baptism with the Holy Spirit I was not grounded in the Spirit I love God I didn't know much of the Word of God but I knew the Word of God was the Word of God I mean, y'all know what I'm talking about and so I wasn't, so when I got to my college years, when all my friends, we all went off to different colleges and universities and whatnot, and so my social circle kind of dispersed at that time, and I really, because I lost my, didn't lose my friends, but we all just kind of went in different direction, I really kind of lost my meaning for going to church, because I wasn't really grounded, 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 and so what I would do, I'd go on Easter, and I would go on Christmas to church. How many of y'all ever been in that boat before? Yeah, that's right. And, and that's the way I did it through my college years. And I never doubted Jesus. I never doubted the Word of God. I, I never became a, a heathen or anything like that. I just didn't go to church until in my final semester at the University of Florida, graduating in the College of Architecture, I met that little blonde girl right there. And to go out with her, I had to go to church. And I thought, well, I know church. Yeah, I know church. Sure, absolutely. Let's go to church. She says, well, we'll have to go to my church. And, and girls, you, that's what you need to say, girls. I'm telling that's what you need to say, girls. I, come on now, girls, listen to me. That's what you need to tell that boy. There will be no date until the first date is on a pew in the church of your choice. And it better be this one. I said, it better be this one. And if Debbie and I don't sign off on that boy, no, I'm, I'm kidding now. <laughs> That's between you and God and your mom and dad. But, uh, but if we get a vote, we'll vote, let me tell you. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll probably say, uh-uh, I don't think so. <laughs> no, we'll be kind. Um, but to go, to go out with her, I had to go to church. And she took me to a Pentecostal church. And that's the first time that I ever had the revelation of the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit in the church. First time. And I thought, that's it right there. That's it. That's it. And I don't know if I've ever missed a Sunday since. And then we got in under the teachings of the Clarks, and they raised us up, and God has set on the right path, and, and uh, married us, baptized me in water, baptized me in the Holy Ghost, got everything going, here we are today. And so, but, but I say all that to say this. When Paul asked those believers, did you receive the Holy Spirit? When you believed, and they said, we didn't even know there was another Holy Spirit offering to, to receive. I would have said exactly the same thing. I know what he's talking about. This is me right in here in Acts chapter 19. Well, it goes on to say that Paul laid hands on them and the Holy Ghost came on them. They spoke in other tongues and prophesied. So the anointing, the baptism with the Holy Spirit is the gift of God that Jesus is wanting to apply to every single believer, everyone who names the name of Jesus Christ. Now, why is this so important? 
because we live in a world where there is an antichrist spirit running rampant because the God of this world, according to scripture, is the devil. And all that he does is anti to Christ. Christ meaning the anointed. Jesus Christ, the anointed one and his anointing. The Messiah simply means the anointed one. Christ is the Greek of the Hebrew Messiah. So Christ means the anointed one and his anointing. But there is an anti-anointing spirit in the earth today. There is a spirit of anti-anointing that is opposed to everything you live for, everything you're trying to do, every goal and desire you're trying to accomplish. The God purpose of your life is opposed by an anti-anointing. God is anointing you for it, but there is an anti-anointing that you've got to overcome to get it done. And it's not just about what's in the world that is opposed to your anointing. It's what's in our flesh that is opposed to our anointing. There's sin. There's selfishness. There's the devil trying to influence us to keep us from pursuing the anointing of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let me just make the point real quickly. Turn with me to 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. There's an antichrist spirit in the earth today. 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. Little children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that the antichrist is coming, even now many antichrists have come by which we know that it is the last hour. There are many antichrist spirits in the earth today. They're opposed to your health. They're opposed to your wealth. They're opposed to your happiness. They're opposed to your purpose. They're opposed to your vision. They're opposed to everything that you set your hand to. They're opposed to the mission of this nation to spread the gospel in the earth today. They're opposed to the church in the earth today. They're opposed to everything Christ is trying to do. There's an antichrist spirit standing against it. But, verse 20 says, you have an anointing. You have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. So that anti-anointing cannot stand up against our anointing. Let me prove it. Go to, go to chapter 4, 1 John 4. Ver, look in verse 2. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. So the Antichrist spirit is in the world. Verse 4, here it is. You're of God, little children. You've overcome them. Somebody say, thank God. Because, you've overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the earth. The anointing, the anointing that is in your life, the anointing that is on your life, the anointing that is living on the inside of you is greater than any anointing that the devil, anti-anointing that the devil might throw up against you. Why? Because Jesus made a show of them on the cross and he shamed them and he showed that they have no power against the believer. He made a show of them and he shamed them on the cross. Hallelujah. Everybody say it out loud. Greater is he he. that is in me me. than he that is in the world. world. Say it again. Greater is he he. that is in me me. than that antichrist spirit that is in the world. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. So we have the ultimate partnership. We were never intended to live independent of the Holy Spirit. We were intended to live 
wholly dependent upon the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I'm going to advantage your life. I'm going to give you the advantage. How many of y'all want the advantage? How many of y'all want the advantage? How many of y'all, if you were picking teams for basketball, would want to pick, pick the tall kid? You want the advantage? Come on. How many of y'all, if you were picking the football team, you want the quarterback with the good arm? You want the advantage. Why? You want to win. You want to win. Jesus gave us the advantage in the game of life so that we would win. So in John chapter 14, verse 16, Jesus said, I will ask the Father, and He will give you another comforter, another one just like me. Let's put it up there. John chapter 14, verse 16, amplified version. Here it comes. Get ready. It's about to hit right now. I'm feeling it. I'm sorry. I, didn't pro I probably didn't put it on my scripture list. I apologize. But here it is. It's coming now. I'm feel I feel the anointing on me right now. I feel the anointing for that scripture coming. I'm, I'm teasing back there. I'll read it to you. Hallelujah. One more verse up. John chapter 14, verse 16. You got it. You're awesome. One more verse up. Well, I'll read that one too. No, I'm not. I'm going to read this one. I will ask the Father, and He will give you another comforter, a counselor, a helper, an intercessor, an advocate, a strengthener, and a standby. Wow. How many of y'all want that? How many of you believe I've got the advantage? If I got that, I've got the advantage. I'm going to win this thing. Thanks be to God who always causes me to triumph in Christ Jesus. Triumph in His anointing. Oh, thank you, Jesus. I'll ask the Father and He'll give you another comforter, counselor, helper, intercessor, advocate, strengthener, standby. And He will remain with you forever. Come on, give the Lord a praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So the cry of our heart must be baptize me with the mighty baptism with the Holy Spirit because we need some radical Holy Ghost moves of God in our lives. We're going to need some radical Holy Ghost prayer, radical Holy Ghost faith, radical Holy Ghost love, radical Holy Ghost forgiveness. There's going to be some things that you're going to walk through in your life that, you're, that Antichrist spirit, that hateful spirit is going to be so offensive to you. They're going to attack you and hate on you and try and undo you. And it is going to take a radical Holy Ghost anointed to look at that person and love that person and forgive that person. Come on. We don't fight against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, mice, and dominions. Oh, yes. So it's going to take some radical Holy Ghost baptism, love, and forgiveness, and some grace. To walk this thing out. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. We need some radical Holy Ghost prayer. Radical Holy Ghost faith. Radical Holy Ghost boldness. Radical Holy Ghost love. Radical Holy Ghost forgiveness. Radical Holy Ghost ministry. Radical Holy Ghost evangelism. Every area of our lives. It's not just for the preacher. For every believer, every believer, wherever you are, whatever you're doing. I'm talking to Debbie between services, and she says, you know, it's not just in the pulpit. She says, it's in every area. It's in the marketplace. It's in every, it's in every area. It's when you shop. You've got to have that anointing. Got to, uh, come on, somebody. Amen. It's every area of your life. I know when I'm anointed to spend money, and I know when I'm not anointed to spend money. <laughs> Debbie said to me, she said, let's go to the mall. I said, I have no anointed to spend money. I'm not going. <laughs> That's true. I know when I'm anointed to spend. 
I know when I'm not. I said it'd be a waste of your time for me to go. I'm not anointed to spend any money right now. And she, she's like, well, I'll go without you. Go in the anointing of God. Go in the anointing of God. And I said, praise the Lord. But then there are times, men, you listen to me. There are times where I'll say, you know what, Deb? I am so anointed to spend money right now. The anointing of God is on me. And Deb's up. She's, I tell you what, there, there must be a suit of clothes in her closet that she can just jump right in them. <laughs> She's fully clothed, comes running out. Let's go, baby. Let's go, baby. She's got her purse. She's got her shopping shoes on. The cat, the car is gassed up. She just leaves it running 24 hours a day, waiting for the anointing to hit me. Let's go, baby. Let's spend that money. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. That was almost a true story. But the, uh, the anointing to spend money, that's a true. That's true. So, Deb, I'm anointed to spend money. Amen. That's it. That's it. The anointing. Do you know the anointing? Do you know the baptism of the Holy Spirit? If Paul were to walk in here right now and say, what baptism have you been baptized with since you believed? Would you know what he was talking about? If you're in the right church to find out. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Did you get anything out of this today? Praise the Lord. Will you stand with me?